So in addition to being the president of Artistic Tiles Wholesale Division, I'm also uh, on the board of directors of the Napa Stone Institute, which is um, a newly formed entity, which is a merger of the Marvel Institute of America and the Building Stone Institute. Uh, so uh, we represent the, the natural stone industry, set the standards for the industry, are promoting the use of natural stone, and have developed this uh, this learning opportunity uh entitled Why Choose Natural Stone um, to, uh, to give users and specifiers uh, of natural stone uh, insight into why uh, we believe, and hopefully you, you agree, natural stone is uh, and always has been the premier building material. Um, so uh, I am a certified speaker through the Natural Stone Institute. I've been, been um, speaking uh, and presenting um, Next to Institute's content, content for, for several years and have been involved in creating much of the content, uh, including uh, this, uh, this, this presentation, uh, which was uh, really born out of um, a couple things. Uh, it was born out of um, the uh, introduction of um, NSC 373, which is the uh, sustainable standard for the uh, production of natural stone. Um, as well as uh, the uh, Use Natural Stone campaign, which uh, was developed by the, uh, the Natural Stone Institute. And you'll see a video from that campaign as part of this presentation, giving uh, users um, ideas and inspiration as to uh, the use of natural stone. You might uh, also, hopefully you'll recognize uh, the Use Natural Stone campaign, uh, the logo, and, uh, and recognize some of the work we've done uh, with the campaign. So this, uh, CEU is accredited with AIA, IDCEC, um, LACES, as well as the NKBA. So um, if you are uh, affiliated with, with one of those organizations, you would be entitled to, uh, to credit. So with um, so many building materials on the market today, this course will uh, reinforce and remind you why architects and designers, uh, and in the case of a lot of you, um, kitchen and bath dealers, kitchen and bath designers, continue to use and choose natural stone for your projects. Uh, throughout our history, we've seen natural stone used in iconic structures, symbolizing strength and permanence. Uh, new materials, manufactured materials, strive to mimic its beauty, but genuine natural materials connect us with our planet and its future in a unique and undeniable way. Its inherent durability allows stone to perform impeccably in commercial and residential applications, both interior or ex exterior. Uh, with the caveat there that it has to be the right stone for the job. It has to be specified correctly, it has to be installed correctly, and maintained properly. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, new technologies as well are keeping stone uh, as a front runner with innovative interior design trends by introdu introducing new textures, patterns, and usages. So we're going to look at some historical uses of natural stone that have stood the test of time, examine some of the attributes of natural stone that allow it to outperform other building materials on the market, uh, find out how the sustainability of genuine natural stone connects us with our planet in the future, and look at some of the latest design trends and how they're satisfied with natural stone. So we're going to look at the history. We're going to review some historical uses of natural stone. Uh, I would think that for most people, if you, in your mind, were to think of the most iconic structures throughout the history of mankind, uh, most, if not all of them, would be um, stone structures of some sort, or certainly have a stone element involved. Uh, very hard to find uh, structures, uh, the iconic structures, built throughout the history of time that do not have um, natural stone. One of the great examples of Roman architecture and engineering was the Colosseum in Rome, built between 72 and 80 AD, originally called the Flavium Amphitheater. It was designed with 80 arched entrances to facilitate the movement of 50,000 people in and out. Travertine was the most prominent type of stone used in its construction. 
Notre Dame de Paris is considered one of the most prominent examples of Gothic architecture and one of the world's most well-known churches. It was started in 1163 and completed in 1345, 182 years later, a masterpiece of design, creativity, and travertine. Milan Cathedral, or the Duomo, as it's primarily known, is famous for its incredible detail work. Amazingly enough, constructed primarily of marble, it was started in 1345 and not officially completed until 1965, a span of more than 600 years. The Taj Mahal, a white marble mausoleum located in India, is regarded by many as the finest example of Mughai architecture and the jewel of Muslim art in India. Begun in 1632, it took more than 20 years to complete, and it stood for almost 500 years. Since the 13th century, a wide variety of stones have been used to build castles, royal palaces, and churches. Most of them are still standing today, a testimony to the uncommon durability of stone. Funny how things have changed. If we're late by a couple of days on our deliveries, our clients are very unhappy. Um, some of these projects took hundreds and hundreds of years uh, back in the day. Uh, some other interesting uh, projects to look at uh, include uh, both Easter Island and Stonehenge, which had uh, both had a ritual component to them, um, symbolic component, and that involved gathering um, uh, local materials, local rocks. Um, in the case of Stonehenge, those larger pieces uh, come in at about uh, 25 tons. So they uh, are uh, similar in, in, in size and weight to blocks that are quarried uh, today for the production of, of natural stone. Uh, of course, um, no discussion of, of natural stone would be complete without a mention of the Great Pyramids of, of Giza. And what's interesting is the way we see the pyramids today is not the way they initially looked. Uh, there was a, uh, a limestone cladding, and you can see a little bit of it on the top of that middle pyramid. You can see the original uh, cladding that was left. Uh, much of the limestone cladding was uh, re, uh, re-harvested um, from, um, uh, from, from the pyramids and used as uh, paving in Alexandria. So this idea of reclaiming and reusing natural stone goes back uh, for, for, for eons, uh, and really exhibits the practicality uh, and the, 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 the never-ending use and enduring properties of natural stone. Uh, another interesting uh, natural stone uh, application would be Machu Picchu, which sits at about 8,000 feet above, uh, of sea, above sea level, a very remote area in Peru. Uh, and we still to this day don't really understand why Machu Picchu was uh, was located where it was. It looks like a very difficult uh, locale to to build in. Uh, certainly quite beautiful. And the Incas were known for choosing locations based on a, a divine inspiration, so to speak. Uh, whereas other civil civilizations would choose locations based on transportation or security, uh, perhaps at the mouth of a river. Uh, or a valley that they could control, the Incans were uh, were choosing their uh, locations to build cities based on uh, a sign, uh, based on the sun hitting uh, a hillside in a certain way and uh, uh, giving them that, uh, that feeling of design inspiration. Uh, the Roman Colosseum was discussed in the video, uh, and again, this is a, an example of um, a structure that was really clad with, with travertine, and a lot of that material has been uh, removed and reused in other uh, construction uh, projects uh, along the way. So we don't see the actual original uh, facade of the Roman Colosseum in, in, in many, many cases. Petra in Jordan is an interesting use of natural stone in that Petra was not built with natural stone, it was built in natural stones. It was actually carved right into the sandstone mountainside. So you can see uh, the, the, the vanning and the flow uh, of the veins. This was a lost city for quite some time, uh, and more recently 
you know, rediscovered. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Petra uh, is subject to deterioration due to efflorescence, uh, and you can see some of that on the lower part of the facade, uh, where the stone looks a little bit lighter. You have these rising salts and minerals coming through the stone uh, that are that are being deposited uh, and and causing some um, some spalling on the face of the stone. Uh, the Acropolis in Greece uh, used a white marble, um, Pentelican marble, which was quarried, uh, my understanding, about 25, 26 miles away um, from the Acropolis. Uh, and that's a material that in, in some forms is still available today, although the actual original quarry is reserved for, for um, historical preservation work. But certainly the, the columns of the Acropolis and the white marble um, from that that uh, structure is certainly uh, iconic, and and Greece is still really known for its white marble. When people think of a uh, you know Greece and marble, the first thing typically that would come to mind would be Thassos, which is a pure white or nearly pure white crystalline uh, marble. So up to this point, we have been looking at um, structures where larger stones were used, stone cladding, stone pavings, and things like that. It's also you know, very interesting to look at the use of mosaics going back to the Roman times uh, and the way mosaics were used to depict different uh, scenes, uh, different life cycle types of events, uh, different leisure activities. And mosaics were an art form that was really uh, utilized uh, in the homes of the rich and famous. Uh, there were different types of mosaic artists in the, in the field. Some would do their work in a studio and bring it to the site. Other work was done directly on site. There were different methods developed, uh, had a wealth of different stones that were uh, quarried and transported throughout the entire Roman Empire. Uh, so many of the uh, bright colored marbles were found in the Pyrenees, in the border between uh, present-day uh, France and, uh, and Spain, whereas Italy was, was more uh, well-known for its, its white marbles. Um, there are examples of stones uh, that were transported from Egypt and other parts of, of North Africa as well. The largest, uh, the, the, the largest wealth of, of Roman mosaics today has actually, actually been found in North Africa, in Tunisia, which was known as the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. That's where uh, the Roman wheat was grown, uh, and uh, it's very, you know, relatively short distance uh, from North Africa to the southern tip of, of Italy, making transport. Uh, very practical. Uh, so many of these Roman mosaics have survived earthquake and fire uh, and destruction of these, these cities, uh, li leaving us with tremendous relics uh, of the time uh, gone by. Uh, the reason why do they survive so well? The small tesserae or the small sized pieces uh, really provide a uh, flexibility and it allows the, the stone to move with the substrate. So what attributes of natural stone influence architects and designers to continue to choose stone in their projects? Um, well, natural stone is uh, certainly uh, natural. Um, uh, it is uh, material that's harvested from its in situ position, meaning where it was formed in uh, the Earth's crust. Uh, and natural stone does come from the, the, the earth's crust. People often ask, well, will we ever run out of stone? You know, the, the natural stone is abundant. Uh, we may run out of a certain variety, uh, but we're not going to run out of natural stone. Um, we have um, always have new materials that are being, uh, uh, new quarries that are being opened up, new materials that are being worked, and, and, and new opportunities. The issue or the concern here is what's the sustainability uh, of, and the sustainable practices that are being employed here. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later on as well. Um, talking about stone being harvested from their in situ position, in order to be considered a natural stone, um, we can't alter the natural fabric of the material. So there are man-made materials out there that utilize a natural component, that utilize perhaps crushed stone, and they, they press it or they mold it and they reconstitute it 
you know, perhaps with a cement binder or a resin binder or other type of binder. Uh, although that has a natural stone component, by definition, it does not, it is not considered to be natural stone because we have altered the natural fabric of the material to achieve um, the, uh, the, the finished product. So, oops. Uh, so, part of the allure of natural stone, I don't know if you guys saw that, I have this little um, thing on, on my screen and I'm trying to move around so I can see my presentation. Uh, anyway, so natural stone connects us to our history uh, based on the use of natural stone in these iconic structures, it certainly connects us to our present as well as the future, uh, and, and, and certainly grounds us, connects us to our planet. So here we have this little cartoon going back to the time of, of, of Barney Rubble uh, and how um, to Wilma, um, I guess, uh, really loved her granite countertops. They were just blocks of stone at that point, uh, but still granite countertops. So the granite countertop business, uh, one of the oldest, oldest uh, one of the oldest businesses, uh, you know, known, known to man. Part of the allure of natural stone also is, is, is it allows us to connect ourselves to another part of the world into a project. So, you know, perhaps a user might choose a natural stone from their country of origin or the country of their forefathers, or perhaps they're choosing a natural stone based on a country that they, they uh, love to visit uh, and were inspired by that visit, or perhaps, you know, they're, they're choosing a white marble from uh, Vermont because they spend their weekend skiing in Vermont, and they just want to bring that, that home with them. Uh, there's the aspect also of using local materials, uh, and we see uh, certainly some, some local uh, differences in the way natural stone is used, which contributes to this vernacular architecture. So the way you know, natural stone may be used in, um, in South Florida could be different or is different than the way it's used in Connecticut, and partly by uh, design aesthetic, partly by, you know, climate uh, and what stones are going to hold up, um, you know, over time in those environments. Natural stone has historically been used to express the stability and power of government inst institutions. So most of your state capitals, your uh, libraries, your, your um, Court buildings are built with natural stone to pr provide a, an expectation of permanence, a grandeur, uh, and, and, and express the stability and power of these institutions. Uh, and, and the grandeur of natural stone is really befitting of these monumental structures. Um, you go into an older building in the lobby and you'll see uh, perhaps book matched natural stone slabs on the wall. Uh, and they're really just telling a story. These, these, these stones uh, evolve over time. The stone is really marking a place of significance. Um, again, your most iconic buildings in history are, are, are made with natural stone, uh, which creates an expectation of permanence. Now, this expectation of permanence can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. If a client expects something to last forever and is not willing to invest in the proper installation techniques and the proper maintenance, maintenance techniques, uh, they are uh, likely to be disappointed. So we need to be having those conversations up front with the, with the client. Understanding the uh, limitations of an individual natural stone uh, relative to the client's uh, needs and expectations. And we choose the, the proper stone to achieve both the aesthetic and performance characteristics of the, of the project. Install them uh, properly uh, and maintain them properly and we have a durable surface over time, but it's a living surface. It's a surface that uh, will, uh, can, can change uh, over time. Uh, natural stone can create a sense of luxury and sophistication. Uh, and interestingly enough, it's suitable for design styles that range from rustic to elegant. So when I started uh, in the natural stone business over 20 years ago, we were selling very rustic materials, tumbled marbles and things like that. And then 
uh, we moved away from that and got into more polished finishes. Uh, so they became a little bit more elegant than rustic. And now we're at a little bit of a point where there's, there's, you know, demand kind of both ways. We're seeing an increase in demand for rustic tumble types of finishes. Certainly, uh, honed versus polished pretty evenly split. Uh, and a lot of it depends on the material and the usage uh, characteristics. Um, Mentioned stone evolves with age. Stone actually, the, the term that's used is, is patina, right? So, so stone takes on a, a different look and feel over time. Um, that, that, that patina, uh, many people would argue that it, it improves the look uh, of the natural stone, creates a different uh, feeling. Natural stone needs to be touched. Uh, it's not something you just look at from a distance. When you feel it, that's when it really, uh, really speaks to you. Uh, and where people really connect with the materials. Uh, each stone is unique, even when it's quarried from the same location, all right? Even when it's quarried, you know, quarried in the same, um, extracted from the same quarry, we have to expect a variation. And that will vary based on the material. Some more variation, some less variation, but with every natural stone, we have to understand, you know, what that, that range is, what that expectation is. Um, so, Therefore, as a result, each project incorporating natural stone will have its own distinct allure. And, and really, you know, going back to a, uh, you know, going back to a, a bygone era, we're seeing an increased demand for bookmatch slabs, as shown in this in this picture. And this is really hard to to replicate with a man-made material. Uh, sure, you can screen print on. Uh, on, on porcelain slabs and create a similar effect, but uh, you're not going to have from slab to slab the, the natural shift in movement, which creates a one-of-a-kind installation. So an installation like this is unique. It's a unique reflection on the the work of the design professional. It offers a legacy of their work, um, uh, and and really, uh, you know, a tremendous stamp on their their career. This is an interesting project shown here in this picture. Uh, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, where they added on to a, a, a very small historic building, uh, and they used a more co contemporary design, uh, you know, on the right-hand side as opposed to the more traditional design on the left-hand side. And uh, the architect really figured it out in a way that it it, it, it just seems to work. Uh, sometimes that type of uh, blending of styles uh, can be very uh, clumsy. In this case, I think that they really. Uh, they really nailed it, and the natural stone plays such an important part in that um, in the finished product. So, with natural stone, um, we have a wide range of aesthetics that can be achieved, a wide range of form and function. So, color-wise, you know, color tones in natural stones that range from white to black, you know, to virtually you know every color in between. Right? And within those colors, you have light and dark. Uh, we can play around with the color by changing the finish. Changing finish not only potentially changes the texture and the performance, but it also can change the color tone as well. Uh, polish will bring out more color, and more of a matte home will mute the color um, to some extent. Uh, veining. We have stones that uh, have very little in the way of veining, and we have stones that are extremely heavily veined, stones that uh, the veining direction is wild and all over the place, and stones that are, you know, more linear in direction. There are stones that are nearly perfectly flat in their uh, linear veining, and then some stones that are at a few degrees uh, off of uh, uh, off of flat in their in their veining direction. So it's all out there. It's evolving. It's changing. We have stones with larger grain structure, smaller, tighter grain structure. Varies uh, by material. This informs the performance and the usage as well. Now, uh, amazing thing about natural stone, um, within the confines of limitations of the actual material, uh, natural stone can be supplied in many different sizes. Uh, so you want larger formats, uh, you want thicker material. Um, depending on the material, it may be available. So just because a stone is marketed as a, let's say, 12 by 24 inch by three eighths inch tile. If you wanted 48 by 48 by three quarter, it may be possible. Now the price could be significantly higher. There's a lot of factors that have to uh, be looked at, but it's certainly possible. 
Natural stone can be a structural material. Uh, it also can be a decorative material. Uh, natural stone is relatable to our connection with nature. So this is a picture from Red Rocks where an amphitheater was built out of stone into the stone. So very similar, uh, you know, in idea and concept to uh, Petra in Jordan, uh, but uh, an amazing venue. Uh, and this is when you get amazing sunsets there, a lot of, uh, Lot, you know, a lot of beautiful colors uh, in the in the evening sky. Uh, as mentioned, new quarries are continuously being opened and revitalized to meet evolving market trends and client expectations. And you know, really interesting for me to see some stones that were you know on the market uh, when I started in the business over 20 years ago had really disappeared from the market strictly you know based on on supply and demand, really based on demand. Um, are now starting to resurface again. Uh, so it's kind of fun to see that. Um, it's fun to see that happening and, and, and seeing how the stones look today as compared to 20 years ago and, and what we can do with them. Uh, as mentioned, stone can be used for both structural and decorative applications, uh, so the possibilities are, you know, tremendous. So, uh, you know, we see in terms of countertop applications, I mean, three-quarter inch, inch and a quarter, uh, for a time, a lot of people wanted to go with two inch stick for, for your, your island tops, uh, which wasn't necessarily the most fun for your fabricators in terms of bringing that in, uh, to the job site. Uh, you know, wall cladding, uh, if you want to build the building out of, you know, two foot thick blocks of stone and stack them on top of each other, that's possible. If you want blocks, uh, it's available and out there. Uh, natural stone is versatile and can be used in both classic and contemporary. So rustic, modern, uh, classic, contemporary architecture all works with natural stone. Uh, just, you know, choose your color and finish and, and design aspect accordingly. Uh, and very interestingly how one stone can perform those different tasks as well. One stone done in different finishes, different sizes, different textures can really, um, you know, act as a chameleon and, and, and move from one style to the next. Uh, natural stone as well can really satisfy multiple design elements. So in this case here, you're seeing it used as cladding, you're seeing it used as wall base, as paving, as, uh, as wall stone, as stair treads, as planters, all the same material, different finishes, some dimensional, some, uh, some, some cubic, uh, some in slab and block form. Uh, so this is one of the fantastic things about natural stone. Harder to achieve, uh, you know, this diversity with a man-made material. Uh, another uh, great benefit uh, of natural stone is the ability to change those finishes that you mentioned. And those finishes can be changed to change the appearance uh, of the material, make it appear lighter, make it appear darker. It uh, can also influence the material's performance. Uh, so you might put a, uh, a texture on the stone to allow it to be used outdoors uh, as a paving material, uh, a non-skid paving material, whereas in the interior you're going to want a smoother finish. Um, so it's all derivatives of the same material. Uh, it gives you those options. Natural stone can be refinished and repaired, re refinished, repaired, and restored. It really should be considered into your specification of natural stone. You know, how often are we going to need to have a professional come in to refinish this countertop? Or how often are we need to repolish or, or refinish our, our, our paving? That's going to vary based on the material, the usage, and what's the client's expectation. So here we see a, a, a before and after on a, on a fountain and how this was really, you know, revitalized. We had some open banding that was repaired, cracks repaired, uh, so they really did a, a beautiful job there. When we're looking at natural stone, we always have to look at uh, the life cycle cost, the total cost of acquiring, owning, and disposing of, of the material. Now, natural stone should never... Uh, wind up in a landfill, so our disposal costs should be very low. And, and in fact, in many cases, natural stone can be uh, reclaimed uh, and reused. So uh, natural stone may may cost a bit more uh, in terms of acquiring and then installing than other materials. Uh, but if you design and utilize it for um, 
multiple generations, the total cost of acquiring, owning, and disposing come on an annual basis uh, comes down tremendously, and that's really be looked at and, and thought of. Uh, as mentioned, it's really important to specify the proper materials, install them correctly, and maintain them as intended. And a tremendous resource for you in uh, achieving that would be the uh, Dimension Stone Design Manual, which is published by the um, now Natural Stone Institute. Uh, so the Dimension Stone Design Manual is going to be a resource for uh, any um, – Slab, natural stone slab related installation, whether it's as countertops or uh, paving materials. You want to know uh, what my unsupported stand is or unsupported cantilever on a uh, countertop is and how often I have to support it with corbels. You're going to have this information in the DSDM. If you want to learn more about installing natural stone tiles, when we say natural stone tiles, those would be natural stones with a facial dimension uh, of, of less than 24 inch, uh, less than 24 by 24, and thickness less than three quarters of an inch. Uh, that information will be available in the Tile Council of North America handbook, uh, TCNA uh, handbook uh, for the um, installation of ceramic, uh, glass, and stone tile. If you are using the Tile Council handbook you know, for the installation of natural stone tiles, just please make sure that you are referencing and utilizing uh, uh, methods for natural stone that can be found at the back of the handbook. Uh, your tile methods are found in front of the handbook, and your stone methods are found at the back of the handbook and indicated uh, with the word stone. So what type of formats are natural stones typically processed? Well, you have to start with block, right? Uh, we quarry the material, and it comes out in blocks, and some of those blocks will look like this one, very regular, rectangular, or quite large. And in some cases, depending upon the material, it might be more fractured. Maybe it's an onyx, for example. Uh, your blocks may be much, much smaller than this. You know, perhaps it's looking at a newer quarry, and, uh, you know, until they really get up and running, the material found on the top layers of the quarry uh, are going to be subject to more uh, fracturing and more environmental uh, wear and tear, so those blocks could be smaller. Uh, so, so it's important to, you know, understand the material that you're working with and how that affects uh, the finished product. From there, we go to uh, dimensional cut to size or cubic types of work. So here we have, uh, on the upper left, we have a CNC carving going on, making a more contemporary carving uh, out of dimensional stone. Uh, on the right-hand side, side uh, upper right-hand side, we have uh, Hand carving uh, of, uh, of, a, of a column, of a capital. Um, on the bottom right, you can see diamond wire saw cutting a, a block of stone, and then we have some uh, monumental work on the, the lower left. You can also buy boulders. This would typically be more of a, a landscape um, application. Uh, boulders would, are, are, are much more commonly purchased, you know, in a local market. Uh, again, that local vernacular architecture, one of the materials that are found, you know, locally in that environment just fits in to the, uh, to the aesthetic better. Uh, then you get into slabs. Uh, so slabs are, uh, you know, available typically in 2CM or three quarter of an inch thickness and inch and a quarter or 3CM thickness. Uh, but, but slabs at two inch thickness can be, can be had for, uh, for particular projects. Uh, from slabs, we can create countertops. Uh, we can you know, do some laminating and do different work uh, to create cubic material as well, or dimensional material, rather. Uh, we can also uh, do cut-to-size work from slabs. So perhaps I want to take a slab and cut it into 36 by 36 is for a entry foyer. That would be considered cut-to-size work from slabs. Uh, then you move into tile. The tile is produced differently than slab. Slab is produced on a gang saw uh, with uh, either a diamond wire or a rigid blade, which is cutting the slabs to the desired thickness and then calibrating them, whereas tile are produced on a uh, block cutter with a, uh, a rotary uh, diamond wheel, which is cutting strips. So tile production is developed, uh, you know, more recently than slab production and really uh, – from a sustainability standpoint, it's very interesting because it allows us to utilize smaller blocks, less desirable blocks. Typically, your best blocks 
of natural stone are going to be cut into slabs. Uh, and your lesser blocks are going to be cut into tile. Why? It's not because we want to put lower quality tile at it. Because the blocks with the flaws, when you're when you are producing tile, you have more opportunities for selection. Uh, you know, uh, to to pull out the the areas that are not of the top quality, or 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 you have more opportunity to create first and second choice uh, on these materials. <coughs> with natural stone, as it's a dimensional material, you have the opportunity to create moldings as well as a wealth of mosaics. And again, mosaics you know, really dates back to uh, Roman Roman times and, and, and beyond. Allows you to take you know scraps and bits and pieces of natural stone and create you know wonderful designs that really perform quite well. Uh, natural stone mosaic on a shower floor is wonderful. It creates a you know non-skid uh, surface. It uh, depending upon the pattern is really uh, pliable and, and complies to the compound curvature of your shower pan. Uh, so extremely versatile. <laughs> Over the last several years, mosaics have really gone in the direction of uh, of water jet. Uh, so water jets are used to to produce uh, many of the mosaics that you see. Now, typically when I uh, when I'm presenting in front of a of, of, a, of a live audience, I'll ask, "So with a water jet, what's doing the cutting?" And the typical answer is, "You guys can only answer that question to yourself." Uh, most people think that it's actually the water that's doing the cutting, and it's actually um, not the case. We, when we're cutting natural stone, we're using uh, what's known as abrasive water jet technology, uh, where a uh, cutting media is introduced. Um, in the case uh, of, of, of natural stone, typically it would be a garnet powder, which is introduced, and you have with water jet, you have a pump, an intensifier pump, which is pumping water at you know up to about 60,000 psi. Uh, through an, uh, a very small orifice. And this garnet powder, essentially like a sand, uh, is introduced at the rate of about one grain of sand per linear foot of water. And that water is moving at about Mach 3 speed. So essentially it's a very finely focused uh, sand blasting instrument that allows, um, that allows us to uh, create very intricate designs, uh, very tightly nested parts and pieces, uh, you know, very, uh, very precise. Water jets are used for machine parts, for aerospace, and things like that, and we're utilizing it extensively in the natural stone industry. Stone can certainly be used for ground cover. Uh, so applications, where does the stone work well? Commercially, we're seeing it educational, institutional, and these are areas, you know, government, you know, these are areas that really speak to some of the origins of natural stone, as well as, you know, religious, historical renovations, um, Hospitality, uh, you know, big area for natural stone. Transportations, transportation airports, train stations, and any type of memorial work. Uh, if you want to memorial, memorialize something, you know, what better than the use of natural stone for that purpose? Also seeing natural stone used in parks, monuments, and fountains. So here are a couple of examples of, of beautiful commercial applications, exterior applications. Uh, then we get into residential where we're seeing natural stone used for countertops, for flooring, for paving. You know, shower walls and tub surrounds, staircases, sinks, fireplaces, tables, and also very importantly, architectural elements. And you want to put something, uh, you know, on the wall of a, of a dining room. I, you know, I can't tell you how many people come in, and, you know, and look at a slab of natural stone with a beautiful vanity and say, it looks like a piece of art. And I say, well, hang it up on the wall like it is a piece of art then. You know, it doesn't have to be in the context of a, you know, traditional, you know, wall installation. If you find a slab that you love, uh, you know, hang it up. Put it up on the wall. So here's some residential applications using natural stone. Uh, we're also seeing natural stone certainly used for exterior, for paving, pool surrounds. Uh, depending upon the stone that's cho chosen for a pool surround, can really give you, you know, a surface that doesn't heat up um, tremendously well. Whereas other varieties, these darker colors, you know, denser materials will heat up, um, you know, like a man-made material. Um, steps, treads, and risers, and this is where the diversity, the, the, the flexibility of natural stone really pays off in that, you know, if you want cubic material uh, to create treads and risers or, or full steps, uh, that's possible. Uh, we're seeing a lot in the way of outdoor kitchens for natural stones uh, as well. So here's, again, a couple of exterior applications, uh, you know, 
interior applications include, you know, countertops, flooring, cladding. Um, we've talked about many of these different areas already. Uh, so we're going to look quickly at some sustainability aspects of natural stone and how it connects us with our planet in the future. Certainly, you know, your better quarriers and manufacturers would uh, utilize responsible quarrying uh, techniques. Um, many of these, these quarries now are moving towards certification under the NSC 373 standard. Um, natural stone, as mentioned, is abundant in supply. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's funny. Sometimes we'll get a client who says, you know, I'm I'm green. I'm you know I, I want to build um, you know with green design. I want to design with green design, but I want this natural stone with this particular color selection. The reality is, if you're utilizing natural stone um, as a, as a green building material, the proper way to do it is to you know utilize the four range, limit the waste as much as possible, come up with unique ways to you know, utilize your, your job site cuts, perhaps cut it into mosaics and, and, and create some shower floors out of it. So the more of the material you use, the more responsibly, um, you know, it's being utilized. So you could buy material from the most responsible company with the most responsible acquiring technique, but if you're wasting a lot of it, uh, it, it kind of uh, defeats that, uh, that purpose. Um, in terms of uh, your ecological responsibility, what are the quarry reclamation plans, right? So the quarry, when it, when it is uh, finished, when it is exhausted, what's going to happen to it? Is it being turned into a water park as, um, you know, the, the, the middle picture and the lower picture? Um, in that case, this is actually um, from a, an old brownstone quarry in Connecticut that's been turned into a, uh, a, a water park. Um, so we see quarries that have been turned into golf courses and municipal parks and things like that. And, you know, what are we doing to respect the, uh, the, the habitat? Uh, natural stone certainly is environmentally responsible. It doesn't off-gas. There's no VOCs in its, its raw state. Uh, we spoke about life cycle cost. Uh, I mentioned earlier the re you know, recycling, recycling of natural stone. There's really no need for it ever to go into a landfill. So if you have a large-scale uh, demolition of a stone project, what can you do with it? It can actually be ground up and used uh, as roadbeds and, and aggregates. Uh, natural stone has a very low embodied energy. Unlike some man-made materials, we don't have to fire natural stone, right? So we're not using fossil fuels to heat up a kiln uh, to, um, to, uh, to create the finished product. So low embodied energy, chemical free, uh, and most manufacturers, um, where, where possible, uh, are reclaiming water for the production of natural stone. Why? I mean, sure, it makes environmental sense, but in a lot of cases it just makes, you know, sense from a, from a financial standpoint as well, not having to buy, you know, new water. Uh, and, and in the production of natural stone, you're utilizing uh, a lot of, in, in many cases, not all, but in many cases you're using, a, you know, a lot of water. So, you know, ideally you want to be reclaiming that water, uh, filtering it and, uh, and reusing it. Uh, in terms of use, you want to seek out companies that uh, are giving back to their communities, that are involved in their communities, that take care of their employees. Uh, you know, we love the idea of adapting the use of closed quarries and as well as the health and human safety. Uh, NSC 373, we spoke about that briefly. Now, hopefully over the coming years, we'll see more about you know, the standard, you'll see more about this certified genuine stone. This is basically giving you the good housekeeping seal of approval that this quarry has been uh, and manufacturers have been independently uh, certified to meet, uh, meet, meet the standards uh, as, as uh, set forth in NSC 373. And there are many different aspects uh, you know, of that standard. So looking at uh, trends uh, with natural stone, uh, one thing that's, I think, really interesting is, is this armadillo vault, which is a really innovative design. This was uh, introduced at the, uh, the Biennale in uh, this is where, oh, it's going to work. That's good. So this was introduced at the BN Alley in Venice two years ago. And the design here, um, this is a, a, a compression um, type of installation where uh, the pieces were, were, were designed using computer design, uh, were cut on CNC and loose fit uh, on this wooden structure. And then the wooden structure was removed, and it was a self-supporting um, design. So I'm going to show you a quick video of this about. 399 pieces of stone in this, uh, this installation.
Here they're using CNC technology to cut the stone, cut and shape the stone. Here they're dry fitting it, which the final place is also dry fit. We should have test on. So this whole structure now is compression fit, no border, no uh, no adhesive, no anchors of any support. Uh, it's just pieces tightly fit that are supporting each other. 399 of them. You know, in the, in the really interesting, beautiful kind of product. You know, old style, construction utilizing uh, modern, utilizing modern techniques. Uh, and this really fits in to uh, biophilic design, where you're really incorporating natural materials, light, um, and other experience of the natural world of the modern built environment. So taking natural stone, taking stone from the ground, and, and putting it in your built environment fits into that, uh, and really speaks to this inherent inclination to want to affiliate with nature. Pe people feel good uh, when they're around natural materials. Uh, in terms of uh, other uh, design trends, this is a project, I believe in California, this was, uh, this is a, a pinnacle uh, award winning, winning design. And what's really cool here, those sculptures in the back, those faces that you see, those were performed, cut with CNC, uh, utilizing stacked pieces of slabs, uh, as you can see on the right hand, uh, the image on the right hand side. Now, the pieces, uh, that are stacked vertically that are running and creating that perimeter around this design are actually the, the cutouts, the leftover pieces. Uh, so uh, this is amazing from a design perspective, from the use of uh, modern technology, and this idea of, wow, they really reclaimed those cut-off pieces and used it uh, as part of the design uh, and as part of the finished uh, project. Uh, this is another uh, Pinnacle uh, award-winning project. Uh, this is uh, actually the Grand Pinnacle uh, award winner. This is a, a building lobby in Manhattan. Uh, so 3D design, 3D uh, 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 CNC sculpting. This was uh, a project that was designed by uh, Zaha Hadid, um, the world-renowned uh, architect who, who, who unfortunately passed away last year. Uh, very, very uh, typical uh, type of work of her style. These flowing, uh, you know, curvatures. Uh, so this is a real, you know, signature piece. This is amazing how each piece was. You know, fabricated, dry laid, sent to the site. You know, already uh, you know numbered and 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 ready to be installed, uh, and have perfectly and tightly the project fit together. Uh, another very important trend. I think this is really important for the NKBA. You know, listeners out there, the kitchen uh, listeners, porch site uh, being a very important trend. What we've seen is you know over the last number of years 
an increase in demand for marble use in the kitchen, but we have a certain segment of the of the users who uh, are are scared off by marble in the kitchen, uh, are concerned about etching and possible staining. Uh, so quartzite, the you know, natural quartzite is uh, is a nice alternative. Uh, you know, typically it doesn't give you as white a color as you're going to get with your statuaries, your calicuttas, and materials like that. But there are some pretty light colors in quartzites and some materials with really dramatic veining, uh, typical of a marble. Quartzite is a sandstone. Um, which is a silica-based material that's undergone a uh, regional metamorphosis. Um, so um, due to heat and or pressure. So it's, it, it's, it's been cooked due to heat or pressure and turned into quartzite. So quartzites typically are uh, very hard material. Uh, true quartzites are not susceptible to uh, acid attack. Uh, if you are working with a quartzite that is susceptible to acid attack, it's, true, it's really not a true quartzite. Uh, you hear people talk about um, soft quartzites and things like that. They're, they're, they're soft because typically they have a calcium carbonate component uh, if they're softer, um, and that's derived from the, um, the time when that stone was a sandstone. The calcium carbonate was actually uh, the binder which held the silica uh, together. So pay attention to your quartzites. Really understand what it is. You know, somebody sells you trying to sell you a quartzite, ask is it susceptible to acid attack. You can always test it yourself as well. Uh, if it if it's not susceptible to acid attack, it uh, you know, could make for a really wonderful kitchen countertop surface. Now, we spoke about uh, water jet and some of the intricate designs uh, that are incorporated. We're seeing uh, combinations with other materials such as uh, you know, metal, terrazzo glass, and things like that. Uh, interesting to see how water jet design with natural stone has evolved from a more traditional usage to uh, today a little bit more, more cleaner and contemporary design. With natural stone, we're seeing uh, more in the way of textures um, than we have seen for a while. And these textures are you know, less dry and dusty and gritty than they have been, uh, more refined, more textile in nature. Um, a lot of these textures have you know, brushed surfaces where you're bringing out some color and making these textures a little bit easier to maintain. So uh, combining um, these textures has, uh, has proven to be a very interesting design trend. Uh, from a fabrication standpoint, we're seeing much more in terms of mitered, uh, you know, mitered uh, aprons, you know, very clean waterfall types of looks. Uh, instead of just three-quarter and inch and a quarter surfaces where you're built up, you might see a mitered edge that, that gives the appearance of a four-inch thick piece of, 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 of stone. And this design trend actually is, is really beneficial because it gives us as a, as an import of the versatility of flexibility, you know, the thickness isn't as important. Uh, you can achieve the same look with a, a three-quarter inch thick material as you can with an inch and a quarter. Uh, so um, that's, uh, you know, that, that, that's a really nice trend that we're seeing uh, in the market. Uh, as mentioned before, marble use in the kitchen has gotten, has gotten very popular over the last number of years. And we're seeing you know, both domestic and imported materials uh, equally in high demand. Uh, these types of waterfall designs, you know, a lot of very dramatic backsplash, you know, types of look where you're just letting the natural stone speak for itself. These types of applications just, you know, in my opinion, cannot be replicated with man-made materials. You know, they are one of a kind. It's a unique reflection on the, the owner as well as the, uh, the specifier or designer. Uh, further to that point, these full slab walls. Uh, we're seeing these installations where no two installations will ever look alike. Uh, they may be a little bit of a challenge, you know, to manage from a design and, and fabrication standpoint, but when they're done right, the finished project, the finished product is uh, undeniable. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of demand for heavily veined stones because if, as you're dealing with these heavily veined stones, you're presenting something that cannot be replicated with a man-made material. So uh, those clients that are choosing natural stone are choosing to do something that's so distinct uh, that really speaks to them. Uh, along those lines as well, you have book mat slabs which are being used, and this speaks to that idea of just creating you know, some wall art, right? These are two beautiful pieces of natural stone that in this conference room they chose to just hang up on the wall. They, they weren't chosen for their functionality. It wasn't really necessary as a backsplash. It wasn't necessary as a countertop. They were chosen for their, their beauty. Uh, and as mentioned earlier as well, home finishes have really gained a lot in popularity, uh, really speaks to the, to the naturalness of stone. With a home finish, when you touch it, it's really hard to replicate 
um, that that feel and man-made material. It's the kind of thing that sometimes you just want to want to roll around on the floor or or or, or run your hands across the, the countertop. Um, you know, so with natural uh, stones, we talked about uh, you know uh, some of the ideas of low VOCs, low embodied carbon energy, as well as the, the longevity, the life cycle. Uh, so those are areas to really look at. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, I've done a good job of reminding you why architects and designers continue to choose natural stone for their projects. Um, it's durable and desirable throughout the centuries. Uh, it continues to evolve, and it's versatile. Um, so here's a nice quote. I think this speaks to natural stone about imitation being the sincere form of flattery. Flattery. Uh, we all know that quote. Here are some references for you. Natural Stone Institute website, usenaturalstone.com, Dimension Stone Design Manual. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, I believe, uh, and, and, and Debbie from the NQBA can answer this, but I believe you can you know, post your questions to us and I can get back to you. You can certainly feel free to email me any questions if you have. Email addresses here. Um, you can call me. Um, so... Um, let me see if okay. I can. Hi, it's Debbie. Ah, I just wanted to thank you so much, Joshua, for this fascinating, informative, and in-depth presentation. I see a couple of questions coming in here, so I just want to quickly review um, the CEU online submission form for those of you that are certified with MKBA. If you need some type of um, certificate of completion, please email or any feedback at NKBA, and then we do have an evaluation survey coming out to you um, tomorrow along with this recording. So I see some questions here. I'm not sure that you're seeing them, Josh, but um, one of the questions is, what is the issue with heat resistance in natural stone countertops? Placing super hot pot pan uh, from oven onto the countertop, or what about cutting and chopping, and what's the ceiling requirement? That's a lot in one question. So I'll try to I'll try to break that down. Um, you know, it, it, heat resistance. Your issue is rapid expansion and contraction, right? So you take something very hot and you put it on a countertop and you get some expansion and contraction, and it's not installed properly. You don't have um, you know you know uh, so, you know you have a clock showing you don't have room or combination for that movement. You know, there's a possibility of cracking. So it's always a good idea to use a you know, some type of trivet on, on your surfaces, whatever they may be, um, you know, to prevent that, uh, prevent that, that, that damage. Uh, it's just, you know, a lot of your materials, a lot of your, 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 your igneous stones, um, you know, quartzites can hold up to it, you know, but why take a chance? You know, I guess it's the kind of thing where you don't know until you know, and when you know, it's too late. Uh, in terms of cutting, chopping on stone, again, I, I think that, you know, the smart thing to do is to have a cutting board. Um, you know, some of these materials, you know, potentially, you know, can, can dull, you know, can dull a knife. Um, you know, I like to cut on a cutting board. It makes it easy for me to, you know, to work off of. You know, some people, you know, choose, uh, you know, choose, choose a different approach. I mean, certainly, you know, there are things cutting, chopping on stone. You have natural stone. Um, you know, bowls that are used for like a mortar or a mortar and, 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 and pestle uh, for, 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 for grinding and cutting. So it's possible. Um, and then um, in terms of sealing requirements for natural stone, that's going to certainly um, vary based on the material and the usage. Um, you know, most stones should be sealed. Uh, if you're talking about kitchen countertop application, you, know, you want to ensure um, you choose your sealer based on do you want a water-based sealer? Do you want a solvent-based sealer? You know, you're cooking on it. Um, you know, be, be careful of claims about sealers, you know, in terms of sealers are a coating that helps to uh, minimize the risk of staining. Um, sealers don't 100% prevent staining, and sealers typically, um, although there are some claims on the market now, and, and um, you know, I'm not sure um, if they've been, substantiated or not, but sealers um, uh, typically do not prevent against etching of a calcium carbonate-based stone. Um, when you have a calcium carbonate-based stone, like a marble or a limestone, and you and the acid contacts the stone, uh, the calcium carbonate will give itself up to neutralize the acid. Uh, so how do you prevent that etching on a calcium carbonate-based stone? Well, one thing you know, you eliminate any acids from that environment, which uh, may be difficult uh, in a kitchen. 
town. You can put a coating on the surface of the stone, which uh, may prevent that etching. But then, you know, you're, you basically put this man-made coating, and you're losing, in a lot of cases, that feeling, that patina, that, that, that surface that you really want to touch. Um, what's been very common these days is the use of a honed surface in a kitchen environment on calcium carbonate-based stone. Why? Because a honed surface essentially is uniformly etched across the surface. So if you do etch it with acid, um, you're less likely to see that difference between the, the polished and the etched areas. Uh, so that will certainly help in your you know, long-term usage. But, you know, if you have a client that, you know, wants to put marble in and they're going to freak out the first time they get a little bit of etching, they might not be the right client for a marble countertop. Uh, so it has, to, it has to be the right material, the right client, the right installation, uh, and the right maintenance. Uh, all right. So how is it possible? There's a question about how to tell if the stone is a marble, a quartzite, or a granite. I mean, you know, you can tell a lot, you know, by looking at the materials, by the grain size, by the grain structure. Uh, a lot can be, you know, indicated based on whether um, it's susceptible to acid attacks. We have acid in our office, or drips of acid on the, the face of the stone or even on the edge of the stone. If you hear it bubbling up, then, you know, odds are it's, it's a calcium carbonate-based stone. And then you start to look at, you know, what does it look like? You know, if it has holes in it, it's probably, has, it's probably travertine. If it's, you know, translucent, then you're going in the direction of an onyx. And, you know, these are natural materials, so they don't come out of the ground with a sign that says, I'm an onyx. Um, but you can start to, you know, characterize the materials based on uh, a number of different factors. There's actually, I, I unfortunately have never been able to participate in it, but there's typically uh, at, um, um, some of the some of the trade shows, uh, they'll do some workshops on how to identify, you know, different stones. There's a there's a great geologist who does some work with the National Stone Institute, uh, who does that that sort of session. So if anybody has any particular questions about that, you can email me, and I can try to, you know, turn you on uh, to to that agenda. Uh, okay. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and I want to once again thank you so much, Josh. Uh, for this great presentation and thank everyone for attending. Um, I can send out uh, Joshua's email now if you do have questions when I send out the evaluation. And uh, Josh, if there's anything else I can help you with or, you know, if you have any other comments or questions, feel free to contact me. And I, once again, thanks to everybody. And thanks to uh, Sarah Gregg, who I believe is also on online with us today. And to you again, of course, Josh. It was a great presentation. Thank you. De uh, Debbie, I see there's a couple of uh, – are you there still? Yes, I am. So there's a couple of questions I see here in the chat. I guess I could probably pull email addresses off of the list and just, you know, kind of take that back up um, online. Sure, you can if you'd like. That's fine. Okay. All right. Let me uh, – I'll, I'll work on that. Great. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you so much. Have a great day.